the glorious festival of St. Peter and St. Paul, the two greatest apostles of Christ. It was on the 29th of June in the year 67 A.D. that St. Peter and St. Paul were put to death near the city of Rome. They were put to death in the first organized persecution of the church under the vicious emperor Nero. And today we commemorate their martyrdom. And that is why the church is in red. The red today stands for the blood of Peter and the blood of Paul. I have one or two other announcements to make. Applications for the camp should be sent in without delay, for it appears that the time is running out. This chapel is not organizing transportation to Ohio, but you may contact Tom Flynn to exchange information about transportation. And your prayers are requested for the father of Father Dennis McMahon, who is desperately ill. He lives in Wappinger's Falls, not very far from here. The city of Rome, in summer, has a horrible kind of heat. Italy, of course, has a Mediterranean climate for the most part, except the mountains in the north. And a typical of the Mediterranean climate is a rainy winter and then a hot, long, dry summer. Now Rome, at this time of year, and for the months of July and August and also September, is almost unbearable. Not only is it hot, but it's a dry, searing kind of heat. And occasionally, a hot wind blows right across the Mediterranean from North Africa. And the result of this dryness and heat is that in Rome, one becomes edgy. On the several occasions in which I've been in Rome in the summer, I felt all on edge the whole time I was there. And I'm sure that on the 29th of June, in that fateful year of 67 A.D., that there was tension in the air, partly from the heat and the dryness of the city, and partly from the fact that shortly before that time, a very terrible fire had devastated a large part of Rome. Now, Rome in ancient times was built very largely of wood, of wood and stucco. It's true, the great buildings, like the buildings of the Forum and the Capitol and so on, were built of marble. But the main part of the city, a city of well over a million people, consisted largely of tenements, five or six stories high in some cases, skyscrapers for those days, built out of wood, smeared over with stucco and plaster. And of course, if a fire started in that sort of condition, the fire would spread and devastate large sections of the city. Now, a rumor was going around Rome that the emperor himself had started the fire. Why, one doesn't know. He had a crazed mind. And there's even a legend that as Rome was burning, that he stood in front of one of his royal palaces on one of the hills of Rome and played his violin and sang in his crooked, ugly voice. So Nero realized that this rumor was going around Rome. And he tried to find a scapegoat. Now at that time, there was a fairly good-sized congregation of Christians in Rome. The foundation basic Roman Catholic Church and Nero made them the scapegoat. He said, the Christians set fire to the city. Nobody knows anything about these people except that they're up to no good. 
they must have done it. So Nero organized and started the first persecution of the church. The first organized persecution. Now Nero was one of the most ugly characters in history. In his character. He was a beast. A monster. He was a great big vicious creature. Much given to his appetites. And to his lust. And under him, Rome suffered. He used to give banquets. Banquets which went on all night long. And all sorts of delicacies were served up. And he had as his companions the worst elements, morally, of Rome. It's said that uh, these feasts would go on for several hours. And then uh, those who felt like it would adjourn to a neighboring room which was called the vomitorium. And with a delicate little instrument they tickled their throat and cleared their stomachs so they could go back in and start all over again gorging themselves. That sort of thing was typical of Nero and his times. Rome was on the downward slide. Also he was much given to passionate lust. Sometimes he entertained parties which turned out into be sexual orgies. So he was not a pleasant character. And when he turned on the church, he turned with all viciousness. Now in Rome at that time were the two greatest apostles of our blessed Lord, St. Peter and St. Paul. Never in the church's history have there been two greater people than those. Saints of God. Saints who are in heaven with our blessed Lord. And the founders of the Church of the Ages. Now, both of them are saints. And let me say right at the beginning, they're not standard saints, what we consider standard <laughs> saints. We Catholics have a sort of a feeling that the standard sort of saint is somebody like, say, St. Francis of Assisi, or the Little Flower. A very gentle sort of person, filled with love, always loving, always gentle, always kind. Now that is one kind of saint, and those saints are the glory of the church. But there are other kinds of saints too. And there are other kinds of saints for this reason. A saint is a person who is filled with the grace of Christ, who receives in fullness the grace that Christ gives. Now the grace of Christ never destroys human nature. It never negates it. It never distorts it. It fulfills it. It develops it. And as a result of that, sainthood is as wide a category as human nature. There are all kinds of saints fitting the different categories of human nature. Now, in the case of St. Peter and St. Paul, we see a particular kind of saint. A saint who is filled with many defects and faults. St. Peter, for example, had many faults. He was an extremely impetuous man. He always leaped before he thought. He was not only impetuous, but he was a frightened man. He was easily frightened. He was frightened of the Jews. He was frightened of all sorts of things. And his fears got the better of him sometimes. Also, he was unstable. Sometimes he was cowardly. It was Peter who on the last night of our blessed Lord's life, when our Lord was being whipped and beaten and kicked, Peter denied him three times. And that was horrible. That was dirty. That was low down. Peter did that. 
Also on the following day, <coughs> when our Lord was suffering untold agonies on the cross, Peter was not there. Peter had abandoned his Lord. All the apostles, except for John, beloved John, they had all left him to die alone. His mother was there, of course she was there. She could never be anywhere else except with her son. Mary Magdalene was there, another saint, the great saint of the church, but with many faults. She was there, and a few women. But Peter was not there. And that was horrible. That was really horrible. When our Lord was suffering there in his lost agonies, it would have meant so much to him if he could have looked out there and seen the honest, rugged face of Peter. Peter's face there would have brought back lovely memories of fish suppers by the lake, of spring mornings on the green hills of Galilee, of conversations over the campfire at night. But Peter was not there. Peter abandoned his Lord. And that was horrible. So Peter was a saint with many faults. But our Lord saw something in Peter which impelled him to make Peter the rock upon which he built his church. What our Lord saw in Peter was this. He saw that Peter would always come back. No matter how far Peter strayed, no matter how deeply he sinned, he always came back. He always came back to Jesus. Like a faithful dog, he came to his master. Peter came back because he knew that there was no place in heaven or earth where he could have peace and happiness and joy except at the feet of his blessed Lord. So Peter always came back. And our Lord saw that in him. That rugged streak of loyalty. That fact that his life was centered in Christ and nowhere else. And so our Lord made him the rock upon which he built his church. And so Peter was in Rome on that fateful day. And when Nero looked over the that community in Rome for which he had hatred and which he was going to seek to destroy. He wanted the blood of Peter. The blood. This blood. Which has made this day a red day down the history of the church. So Peter was a marked man. St. Paul. St. Paul also was a saint who had a great many faults. St. Paul began life as a hater. He hated Christ. He hated his church. And he became a full-time persecutor of the church of Christ. He had a superb education as a Jewish rabbi. He had a subtle, highly developed mind, and he devoted all of his talents to this job of destruction. Destroy the church. Root out this heresy of Christianity. And so Peter lived his life, his life as a hater. Up until that January day when he set out to go to Damascus. He had a list with him of the people in Damascus that he was going to arrest. The leaders of the church there. And as he went along on that January day, riding his horse toward Damascus, no doubt he was picking up the punishment he was going to mete out. The death sentences he was going to deliver until he got to Damascus. And there, within sight of the gates, 
Suddenly, he fell off his horse. And he was surrounded by a tremendous light. And he was blinded. And out of that light, a voice spoke. And Paul knew who it was. He knew who that was. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, that was in Jewish name, why persecutest thou me? Saul knew who it was, but he said, Who art thou, Lord? Notice he said, Lord. Lord. Domine, Kyrie. And that was where Paul went across. In that blinding moment of light, Christ appeared to him really and truly and made him his own. And for the rest of Paul's life, he lived in that light. He never forgot that voice. That voice was always in his ear. And he became the passionate lover of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And for the rest of his life, he gave everything that he had to spreading the Gospel of Christ. Paul had many defects. He was a very impatient man. If he wanted anything, it had to be now, in this moment. He did not suffer fools gladly. He failed to realize that most of humanity were not so intelligent as he was. He snapped and snarled at them quite often. He had a terrible temper, awful temper. It seems that at the beginning of his ministry he quarreled with everybody. Faithful Barnabas, who was probably a very easy man to get on with, Paul quarreled with him. And the quarrel was one of these terrible affairs in which they couldn't look at each other afterwards. They had to separate, get away from each other. <coughs> Paul was like that. He, he had a lot of defects. And sometimes these defects got the better of him. But whatever he had, whatever he had, belonged to his master. St. Paul did not have good health. He makes it clear in his epistles, in his writings, that he often was not well. He was crippled. But whatever he was, however he felt, he was always in the service of Christ. You know, we itinerant priests of the traditional Catholic movement have to travel quite a lot. And sometimes we say, well, we have to imitate St. Paul. Well, in one sense we do. We get around. In my own case, I'm New York now. Next Sunday I'll be in here San Francisco. Two Sundays back I was in Cleveland. The Sunday before that I was in the Bayou country of Louisiana. So I get around, as all our priests do. But the difference between ourselves and St. Paul is this. When we travel, we get into an air-conditioned plane. Or a comfortable Greyhound bus. Or a train, an Amtrak train, which is not too bad. We travel in comfort. When we get to our destination, somebody meets us in a car. So we do it in style. But St. Paul had to walk. It may be that sometimes he had a donkey to ride on. But 90% of the time he walked on his own legs. And he went everywhere. He went all over the known world walking in the service of Christ. You know, some years ago, I had a long leave that turned out to be seven months long. And I spent about half that period in Asia Minor, following in the footsteps of St. Paul as well as I could. I traveled, sometimes by train, sometimes in very rickety Turkish buses. Sometimes, for a few miles, I had to walk. 
And sometimes as I was going along those roads in Asia Minor, near cities where St. Paul had preached, my imagination took charge of me, and I fancied that I could see ahead of me, way down the road, a little figure trudging along on his poor crippled legs. And I thought, there he goes. Bless him. Bless him forever. St. Paul. Even if he had a temperature of 103, even if he felt absolutely miserable, if the call came, St. Paul got up, and on his poor crippled legs, onward he went. Onward and onward, ever for Christ. That was St. Paul. And he never forgot that vision. That blinding moment on the Damascus Road. That dominated his life always. So he was a saint. He had lots of defects. But nobody has ever given himself to Christ more than St. Paul did. Nobody has ever loved Christ more than he did. He was irascible. He barked at people. He was impatient with their weaknesses. He was impatient with his own weaknesses. But he loved Christ. And the most glorious tribute to love was written by St. Paul in his Corinthians message. Now about us faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. Never St. Paul. Pure, vintage St. Paul. So he was a saint. So on that fateful day, in the year 67 A.D., that hot June tense day under Nero, St. Peter and St. Paul came together in death. They came together in the sense that they were both sentenced to death on that day and were executed. Now St. Paul was a Roman citizen. He had inherited his citizenship from his father, although he was a Jew. And a Roman citizen cannot be put to death by crucifixion. That was forbidden. A Roman citizen could only be executed by beheading, which was considered a fairly honorable sort of death, a soldier's death. So St. Paul was destined for beheading. St. Peter, however, was not a Roman citizen. And he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. And he lost it. So their death sentences were entwined on that fateful day. And that was the church's great baptism of the blood of the apostles. And the memory of that survives in the church throughout the ages. So Paul was taken marched through the streets of Rome to the Ostian Gate. And three miles down the Ostian, the road toward Ostia, three kilometers, I should say, was a cemetery known by the name of Tre Fontane, three fountains. And St. Paul was made to kneel down there amongst the tombs and a Roman sword beheaded him. St. Peter was taken to the streets of Rome in the opposite direction. Crowds probably came out and watched him, jeered at him, shouted insults at him. Small boys probably threw stones at him. He was taken to the Circus of Nero on Vatican Hill. And there they prepared the cross. And he was to be crucified. Now both of these apostles knew that their death should be a death for Christ. St. Paul had written in his epistles, For me to die 
is Christ. Christ, Christ. And since Peter knew that death for him meant going back to Jesus. So I can well imagine that when St. Paul was put to death there in the cemetery at Tre Fontani, that just before the Roman sword was lifted, he lifted his head to heaven and he saw the shining light and he heard the voice of his master. And he knew that he was going back to Jesus. St. Peter, according to tradition, was taken to the circus of Nero and there they put the cross on the ground They came and untied his poor, tired old body and led him toward the cross. And he turned to his captors and he said, I have one last request. When you crucify me, crucify me upside down with my head at the bottom and my feet up in the air. And then my death will be more shameful even than that of my master because he wanted a little token sign of his repentance and the bitter hurt that he felt for having denied his master. So his request was granted. And I can well imagine that as St. Peter, he couldn't have lived long. As he hung there on the cross with his head down to the ground and his feet up in the air, I think he looked up at the evening sun and he saw his Lord. Peter went back. Peter always came back to Jesus. There was no other place he wanted to be. So that was the martyr day of two of the greatest saints of the church, the two greatest of the apostles. The founders after our blessed Lord of the Holy Church. This is the day of their blood. Petre et Paule oro pro nobis. Peter and Paul pray for us. God bless you.